Hello, my name is Jennifer Marsman, and today I'm going to show you how to use Azure Machine Learning to solve a challenge, which is if we have all the information about a person, a passenger on the Titanic, can we figure out whether or not they will survive? So it allows us to do some predictions as machine learning does. So what I'm going to do is start by getting a data set. And I'm going to the website Kaggle. Now if you've never been to Kaggle, it is an amazing site, especially if you're trying to learn more about machine learning. Because as you can see, what Kaggle does is it gives you a number of different uh, challenges where there's a clearly defined problem and then a data set. And then you can use those things, use machine learning algorithms to try to solve the problem problem given a set of data. So you can see there's a whole bunch of different options right here. Um, and some of these have amazing cash prizes as well. Some of them you have job opportunities uh, as a, a data analyst or a machine learning data scientist at these different companies. But I'm going to go down to the 101 section um, to explore a little bit more and learn about machine learning. And I'm going to click into the Titanic data set. And so each of the Kaggle challenges work something like this. They define the problem for you and tell you, you know, what is it that you're trying to do. And in this case, we're trying to predict whether a given passenger on the Titanic would survive. Then you actually can get the data, um, and they provide a nice data set uh, that will help you solve whatever problem you're trying to solve. And then you can actually submit to this, this contest. So um, that's where we're going to go and get started. And there's a whole bunch of documentation. And we might jump back to that uh, a little bit later when we're talking about the data. So now let me show you Azure Machine Learning. So I have already created a workspace for myself. And I have opened Azure Machine Learning Studio. And you can get there by navigating to studio.azureml.net. And so within Azure Machine Learning Studio, I'm going to get started by creating a new data set to upload the data that I got from the Kaggle website. So I'm going to go to New, and then hit Data Set, and I'm uploading a local data set. So I'm going to browse to the location of the data that I grabbed from the, the, uh, the website. And it's right here saved locally on my machine, and I want the training set um, to start with. And so I'm going to grab that training set. I'm going to give it a better name. Um, by default, it gives you the file name. So let me call this the, um, how about the Kaggle Titanic Training Data. All right. And then there's a number of different options for you know, what kind of data it is. So you can see we can read in um, a number of different options in addition to CSV. Um, but this is a CSV with a header, so I'm going to leave it to the default and hit OK. And now it is actually uploading that data set for me um, so that I can use it inside of Azure Machine Learning. So next what I'm going to do is create a new experiment while that is running. So I'll go to the experiment section right here. And then um, there's a number of amazing samples. So I suggest um, browsing these uh, to get uh, insights on the kind of things that can be done using machine learning today. But we're going to focus on our problem. And I'm going to build something from scratch. So we'll go into the blank experiment. And what it gives me is a great drag and drop workspace where I can take um, data in different modules and pull those into a workspace to define a workflow that will enable me to make these kind of predictions using machine learning. So I'm going to start. You can see down here that the upload of the data set has uh, completed. So I can click that OK. And so the data that you've uploaded will appear here under your saved data sets. So um, there's a whole bunch of amazing sample data that I suggest you peruse at your leisure. Um, for now, any data that I upload will appear here under My Data Sets. So I'm going to take that and grab this uh, Kaggle uh, Titanic training data and stick it here in my, in my, in my, um, on my workspace. So um, I can also give this a better name. So let's call this the Titanic Survival Prediction. And now, the first thing I'm going to do as a data scientist is explore that data. I'm going to want to know um, information about what the data looks like um, and, and be able to figure out how I can best use it. So I'm going to use some of the tools right within Azure Machine Learning to learn a little bit more about the data and try to derive some insights from it. So I'm going to right click on this data set on the Output node and select Visualize. And this will show me some nice information about my data. So just up front, I can see that there are 891 rows in this data set, um, and then 12 columns of data that we have here. 
So um, the first one is passenger ID. And if I look here, you can see with, with 891 rows, there are actually 891 unique values. So that means each one is different here. Um, and then I can tell here from the one, two, three, four, um, it's, it's pretty obvious that the passenger ID is essentially a random number um, in ascending order that was assigned to these different uh, passengers on the Titanic. So I don't think that's something that we want our machine learning algorithm to use because that's not something that would uh, scale well. If it's a randomly assigned number, then you know, that's not going to help us at all. So that's something that we would not want to treat as an input to our machine learning algorithm. So I think we will, we will get rid of, uh, get rid of that uh, field. The next field is survived. And you can see there's two possible values. It tells me how many unique values there are here in this unique value uh, indicator. And it also tells me the min and the max. So I have a 0 and a 1 are my, my two options. And then all of those things are full. So there's 0 missing values here. And so survived, if you look at the description on the Kaggle website, um, is actually zero if they tragically died on the Titanic. And it's uh, a one if they actually did survive. So um, we can use that as this is the thing that we actually want to predict. Now, in machine learning terminology, the inputs to our machine learning algorithm, so the things that we think are, are dependent uh, that, that will affect the outcome, those things are called features. So our inputs are features. And then the thing that we want to predict, or the output of our algorithm, is called a label. So I essentially want to turn um, survived from a feature, or an input, into a label, or an output. So we'll do that um, next as well. The other thing that I would want to do with survived is um, it's essentially, uh, um, there are some numbers that aren't truly numbers. So think about, for example, a zip code. Um, I could input a zip code into a machine learning algorithm. Maybe I have an algorithm that does something like trying to predict housing prices. And housing prices are, of course, very dependent on the market that you're in. Think about the difference of uh, prices and houses of, of my hometown of Detroit uh, versus something like uh, Silicon Valley, kind of the two extremes of, of housing prices. And so in that scenario, um, uh, your zip code might actually be a very strong factor in how much a house would cost. So it could, might help you in predicting um, housing prices. But when you put something like a zip code into a machine learning algorithm, although a United States zip code as part of our, our mailing address is represented by a, a five-digit number, it's not truly a number. Like you wouldn't want to average zip codes together or perform mathematical functions on them. Because really, underneath, what they really are are categories, right? There's a number that represents um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. There's a number that represents uh, San Francisco, California. Um, so these are really what we call categories, meaning they're discrete um, values and, and not something that's truly numeric. So for some of this data that's represented as a number, we actually want to make it categorical instead. So a good way to think about it, is this a number that I would really want to perform math on? Would it make sense to average it? Um, if it's a number like that, like a zip code, then you probably want to make it categorical instead. So let's take a look here. Survived, I think, is one of those numbers, because it's not actually 0 and 1. Um, this is just a category of survivors or non-survivors. So we're going to switch that from a numeric feature um, to actually a categorical label. All right? The next thing to think about is the class of passenger. So this was the people like, um, <laughs> if we've all seen the movie Titanic, um, you know, the very high, uh, uh, high class passengers um, maybe had first class tickets and others may have had third class tickets. And uh, perhaps I would think that would be a, a big indicator of whether or not they survived. So um, we will use that. And again, that's something that is, is not really numeric. It's, it's representing a discrete category of here is um, the, the kind of class of, of ticket. So I think we'll make that one categorical um, as well. Um, the next thing that we have here is the name of the passenger. So again, I have 891 rows in my total data set. And you can see there are 891 unique names. So that is usually an indicator that this will not be a very good predictor of the output, right? Um, because using something like that as an input to a machine learning algorithm tends to lead to something called overfitting. Um, so think about if we made like something like a decision tree with that kind of input. You wouldn't want an algorithm that says, if the name is Mr. Owen Harris, then he survived. Or if the name is, you know, whatever, they didn't survive. Um, because in those types of scenarios, it won't scale well to new data. 
So when you think about it, we're using machine learning, all it's doing is using past data to make future predictions by applying crazy beautiful math um, and finding the correlation between a set of inputs and a set of outputs. So if we use things like name, where it's very, very dependent on kind of one particular individual, that won't help us as we get new, fresh data in um, to make a good decision on which way to group them as survived or not survived. So that's something that I would actually drop from this data set. I don't want to cheat that as, a, as an input to my algorithm. So I think we're going to get rid of name. All right, the next is a, is a gender field. And you can see we're treating this as a string right now. Um, we don't want to perform any kind of text analytics on it or anything like that. So I don't think that that actually needs to be a string. Um, again, I think that would be more of a categorical uh, variable, where instead it is here's our kind of male and female, or two distinct categories, and whether you fit in one or the other would determine how likely you are to survive. So we're going to make that one categorical um, as well. We can see there's two unique values there, so that tells us a lot. Um, and then age. So age is an interesting thing as well. Now that is a numeric feature, and I believe that should stay a, a numeric feature. And you can see too that Azure Machine Learning uh, provides some really nice histograms. So you can see the distribution of the variable across your data. So you can see we have some people who are very, very young, and then a whole bunch of kind of uh, you know, adults kind of in the middle, and then uh, some, some on, on the more elderly side as well. So there's a nice distribution, and you can actually um, hover over each of these and see you know, who kind of fits in which band there. So um, good, good visualization of kind of the data that we're working with here. Um, the next thing that you might want to do is look at uh, this category. So SIB SP, uh, what this actually stands for is siblings or spouses. So this indicates whether or not you have si a sibling or a spouse on board the Titanic with you. Perhaps people in family groups, you know, were more likely to get, you know, sent to the front of the line to get on a lifeboat first. Um, we don't really know, but what we can do is hand that data to the machine learning algorithm and let it find out whether or not that particular variable um, was influential in the decision or not. So we will go ahead and do that. I want to leave that in. And again, that is a numeric value. We can see a little bit um, about it. The minimum value is uh, zero, so having uh, no siblings or spouses. And then the maximum is eight, so a bigger family. Um, and then there's a similar variable right here as well. This part actually stands for parent or child. And this is a similar variable that indicates whether or not you had a parent or a child um, involved. So another thing that you could potentially do, um, I'm not going to do it in this simple demo today, but another thing that you can commonly do here is maybe change um, both of these columns, sibling and spouse and parent and child, into one single column, maybe family column, and set that either to one um, if you do have family on board or zero if you don't. That might be another way of, of processing the data. Um, the next thing that we can do here is take a look at this ticket field. Now just by looking at the first couple of, of items that we have here, you can see that there's wild diversity in this number. I have something where there's a letter slash number space more numbers. I have something where there's two letters, a space, but no backslash at all, and more numbers. And here's um, letters slash um, numbers, more letters and numbers, and then a period in here, and then more numbers. So you can see there's a lot of different formats that are available here. And with all of these different formats, um, that makes it somewhat uh, maybe hard to parse. So I think what we're going to do is just drop this column. Um, it doesn't look like the actual ticket number is very telling. And you can see that with 891 rows, we actually have 681 unique values for this, this ticket number. So I don't think that's very telling. And, and I think we're just going to go ahead and throw out this data as well. Now the next thing is the ticket fare. Now what this tells us is how much the person paid for a ticket. And you can see, again, there are 248 unique values in that data set, which means people paid like wildly different amounts for the same thing. Doesn't that drive you nuts? That drives me crazy. Especially, I, I think we do the same thing when we're booking airline flights today. You typically see, oh my goodness, this flight is going to cost me um, you know, this much money. And then you go back the next day and actually buy your ticket, and it, it costs 100 bucks more. And you're like, oh, hopefully I would have bought it last night. Um, so it's probably a lot of people flying on the same flight paying very, very different amounts of money. So it looks like this is a historical thing, which we have been doing for a very long time. So um, 248 distinct uh, ticket prices for uh, um, a trip on the Titanic. 
So I do think that this will be a very telling variable in that um, that may indicate kind of what your, your class was on the boat. And that is, I, some, I think, somewhat indicative of, um, of whether or not you survived, if the movie Titanic is any, is any judge there. So we're going to go ahead and leave that in and leave that as a numeric feature, um, as it makes sense to use as a number. Um, the next item is cabin. So this is a cabin number. And you can see for the cabin in our 891 rows, we actually have 687 missing values. That means that there's a lot of data here that's actually missing um, where they don't have a cabin number assigned to them. So I think uh, on the Titanic, some of the more well-to-do passengers perhaps had um, state rooms or, or rooms assigned to them, actual cabins, and many people did not. So this might be an indicator of whether or not it's useful. Um, we could potentially do something like um, change this into a binary value of yes, I have a cabin, or no, I don't have a cabin. Um, and then we could also do some more sophisticated logic if we wanted to around where exactly that cabin existed on the Titanic. There are um, nice maps available of kind of which ones were on which level of the boat and then, you know, which ones were kind of closest to the lifeboats or life crew jacket areas. So those people actually probably had a much higher uh, probability of survival than people who are further away from the lifeboats. So we can potentially do some really, really cool stuff here. For the sake of a simple demo, um, I won't do some of this more advanced uh, analytics, but that's just kind of the process I would go through when thinking about, you know, how might I just dissect this data to get the best possible um, probabilities out of here. All right, and then finally, the very last item that we have here is an embarkment point. Um, so I didn't actually know this uh, prior to playing with this data set, but the Titanic actually stopped at three different uh, ports before making its trek across the Atlantic. So if we go ahead and actually look, I can never remember what the cities are, but if we jump back to the Titanic page, you can actually see in the documentation exactly where these different um, places uh, started from, three different cities, uh, as you can see right here. So if we jump back here, um, you can see that th this is being treated as a string right now. And again, I don't think that that necessarily makes sense because it's not really text that we care about or string that we care about. We instead care about, okay, there's these three distinct um, ports, and so those are kind of three discrete buckets or three categories. So I think, again, this makes sense to change from a string into a categorical variable. So we'll go ahead and do that as well. And then it's nice, too, if we look at the distribution, you can see that the majority of the people actually got on in uh, Southampton. So that's kind of uh, telling as well, just to kind of, okay, how, how would we want to do things? Because looking at things like that can actually help um, when you're thinking about things like missing values. So a lot of times when you're dealing with missing values in your data, you may want to look and see, um, and see all right, if, you know, maybe it makes sense if there's some missing values to just choose uh, Southampton as the default because the majority of people seem to get on there. All right, so now we've kind of explored this data. We've seen how some of the charts and visualizations and the data that's given to us um, from Azure Machine Learning can help us do some processing and some analysis on this data. So now that I've kind of thought through what I want to do with this data and how I might want to convert it and munge it, let's go ahead and actually do those things in the tool. So I'm going to close this for a second. And the first thing I want to do is actually drop some of those columns that I determined were not relevant. So let's do a uh, project columns. And what this actually does is it gives me uh, um, a way to get rid of, uh, to only carry forward the columns that I care about. So I'm going to go ahead and do that by kind of wiring these up and sending this data set to this data set. And then um, for a project columns, I would go here and click. And this will tell me exactly uh, what things I want to carry forward. Now you can either begin with no columns and just add the ones that you care about. And I'm actually going to do it the opposite way where I'm going to start with all columns and then exclude um, the ones that I don't care about. So I'm going to pull through all columns except, um, and you can actually uh, remove columns by virtue of a couple different things. I'm going to use column names since that's what we were working with before. But you could also do things like column type. So just get rid of all string values for me because I don't want to do any text analysis. That sort of thing is also possible. So I'm going to use these column names. And let me exclude, I care about the passenger ID. Well, I, I actually don't care about that. Um, 
but um, that's good to carry through just because when you're actually submitting to Kaggle, you would want to, um, you need to have the ID associated with your prediction. So I'll actually show you how to clear that as a feature and then um, be able to carry it through but not actually use it in the algorithm. So we're going to keep that for now but not actually use it. Um, survived we need, the class we need, we're going to throw out name. Now, of course, um, if we came back and tried to do this a little bit more sophisticated way, there is probably some signal in the name, like there may be more well-to-do names. So you, you could extract out the text, and if there's uh, probably go do some research and find out if there are more well-to-do names in that era, because uh, different eras may have uh, kind of names associated with them, like a Vanderbilt is, you know, someone who probably has a lot of money uh, kind of deal. So there is some stuff we could do, but for purposes of a simple demo, I think we're going to get rid of that one. Um, gender, I think, is relevant. Age is relevant. We'll look at that. Now, remember that ticket was something that was uh, kind of hard to parse in a lot of different areas and lots of different values. So we're going to drop that. And then we're also going to drop um, the cabin number, although we could go back and do some very interesting stuff with that later. But for purposes of a simple demo, I'm going to get rid of that as well. All right. So now we've dropped a couple of things that we don't care about. Now, I also mentioned that we want the ability to um, to uh, clear the feature from the passenger ID since we are passing that through. We don't want it to actually use it in the algorithm as well. So you can also do that. And um, I will tell you, when using Azure Machine Learning, I know the names of lots of the modules. And when you know the names, it's much, much faster to use the search window right here. But if you don't know them, you can kind of easily go in here and explore. So for example, we're doing kind of data cleaning and data transformation right now. So if I go under here and look at manipulation, under there, there is something called the metadata editor. That's where my project columns lives as well. So I'm actually going to pull some metadata editors under here. And the first uh, data that I want to edit is that passenger ID. So I am going to click in here. And I, this time, I'll only start with that and just access the passenger ID. So for just the passenger ID column, um, I'm going to modify it. Now, there's a lot of different things you can modify with the metadata editor. You can change the names of the column, like change the column name to something more descriptive um, if you choose. You can change the data type if you'd like. Um, categorical, we're actually going to do that next with some different variables. And then you can change the field. So by default in Azure Machine Learning, everything is passed in as a feature or an input to the machine learning algorithm. Now, as we saw, some things we want to pass through but not actually use, and some things are actually the outputs. So um, I don't want this to be feature. So what I'm actually going to do is just clear feature on this. So now it will be passed through but not actually used as an input to my machine learning algorithm. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're clearing the feature on passenger ID. Next, we also want to do some categorical stuff, right? We want to make some variables categorical, like I discussed before. But we don't want to um, do, we want to do that with a different set of columns. So that means I need another metadata editor. So I'll pull that over and then wire this guy up as well. And now, looking at here, I'm going to find those fields that I found to be categorical and set those appropriately. So again, I'm going to start with nothing. And we want the survived, because those are kind of two discrete buckets or categories, um, yes or no on I survived. Um, the class of passenger, so first, second, third, are kind of discrete buckets as well. Um, the gender, uh, male, female, again, we're going to treat those as categorical. So let's do that one too. Um, age is a number. Sibling spouse is a number. Parent child is a number. The amount you paid for your ticket is a number. So embarked is also um, those three different part, um, ports that the ship departed from, I would also treat as discrete, um, discrete categories. So I think we're pretty good there. So we've determined that those columns we want to be categorical. So now what I'm going to do is go in here and actually set these and make them categorical. Now finally, I think there's one last thing that I want to do, and that is I want to tell, um, tell my uh, machine learning algorithm what is the thing that I want to predict. And that would be my kind of my, my label as opposed to my feature. So I'm going to grab another metadata editor right here and throw that in there. And I'm going to take that survived column right here, which is what we're trying to predict. And I'm going to set that to be a label as opposed to a feature. Because as I said, um, the, uh, everything is treated as a feature or an input by default. So we're going to set that to be a label or an output instead. So now let me go ahead and run my, uh, run my work. I'm going to go ahead and save. 
and run. Now Azure Machine Learning only actually charges while it's running. So the whole time I spent in there thinking about the data and building up my model and wiring things up, um, I'm not getting charged at all for that time. Uh, the pricing model only charges for when you're actually, um, when it's actually running and, and spinning and, and using that compute. Um, so we'll do that real quickly and then we'll go back to our model and actually see how we've done. So I'm going to right click here, it's finished running, so I'm going to right click here and hit visualize. And let's take a look at the data and see if it kind of looks the way I, I want it to look and see if I forgot anything. So first we'll look at passenger ID. And the passenger ID is a numeric variable and it no longer says feature right here, so that's good. Uh, we want that to be just a numeric that passes right through, but it's not treated as a feature or an input to the algorithm. Um, now we have survived and that's categorical, which is good, so it's a discrete bucket as opposed to a number. And it's a label, so that means it's an output. Good, that's what we want. Um, the class is a categorical feature, good. Uh, the gender is also a categorical feature, good. The age should be a numeric feature, awesome. And then these also are both numeric features, numeric feature, numeric. And embarked is a categorical feature, perfect. All right, so I think we've completed our data cleaning process. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about how to get data into Azure Machine Learning and how to go about um, actually uh, figuring out how to clean it, things that you might want to think about. Um, you typically want to do things with missing values and look for missing values. I, di I didn't do um, a lot of that, but that's another thing to think about. Uh, change things to categorical, uh, use that metadata editor, drop columns you don't care about. So these are the kind of things that we would do as data scientists to work with the data. And so please join me for part two when we take a look at, now that we've kind of gotten that data into a format that we can work with, we, use, uh, we decide on a machine learning algorithm, we run that algorithm, and then we deploy it out production. See you soon.